Right, good. That was just a little bit to get everybody a bit excited. So, um, so just to give you all a little bit of the background, and uh, uh, let's go back here. We are. Um, so, I've spent most of my career working on vaccines um, and um, uh, at the interface of population. Although I'm in the University of Oxford and have been now for quite a long time, I spent nine years at NIBSC, which is a regulatory agency, and I'll talk a little bit about my path. Uh, through this field and try and encourage you to think about uh, pathogen evaluation, population immunity, methods and applications. Now, very kindly, the organisers gave me some learning objectives to uh, to go through. So I've got 20 minutes to tell you about uh, transmission, evolution and adaptation of pathogens, direct and indirect vaccine protection, herd immunity, impact of sequencing genes, population surveillance in public health, very important. Uh, the importance of population biology in public health for viral and bacterial pathogens, uh, choosing vaccine antigens, implementing and scheduling vaccine doses, assessing vaccine efficacy, it's jolly good. And then finally, the challenge of pathogen variability, the mechanisms of variation, uh, roles of mutation, recombination, selection, the ecology of variation, including temporal, environmental, and geographical, and demographic effects. Well, is that the end? No. 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 So... And that's a lot. And I do know also, you've seen that what these courses are very intense. And they're what a colleague of mine once described as drinking from the fire hydrant. So what I'm going to try and do is show you very little new data. Most of the data, and I've got to thank uh, Shamans for giving a wonderful introduction uh, of, a, of, uh, of my favorite topic, the meningococcus. I've worked on meningococcal vaccines for very many years. Um, and, uh, and as he said, we've been involved in a lot of recovery studies. Um, so I'm going to actually invite you, rather than to absorb new data, I'm going to show you some data which probably you're both going to say, oh, well, it's all tedious, we know all of this. But what I'm going to try and get you to do is think a little bit more in population and evolutionary terms, because my experience of the last 35 years in vaccines and 40 years in science is that that's quite a hard thing to do. And it's an extremely hard thing to get policymakers to think about. And we all know when you're implementing vaccines, you've got a lot of people to convince from the prime minister down to the the, 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 the the family with the vaccine and, and virtually everybody in between. And, and these are things that we've all scattered. And that's a big problem because if you ever go to public engagement people, they say, well, you're going to do a public engagement project. It must be very targeted, you know, on 13 to 14 year olds in a particular demographic sort of thing. And I think that's no good for vaccines. We've got to convince everybody all the time. And that's really hard. And, uh, you know, and I think this course is amazing giving you this broad aspect. So I'm going to try and take you through that. So, this is my first picture. It's an iceberg. And I wanted to show this because infectious disease is the tip of an iceberg in the sense that for most pathogens, most infections are not observed. And in feed, a lot of pathogens aren't even really pathogens. And as Shaman said, I like to call them meningococcus and an accidental pathogen. I explain that. Not only an, a, 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 the pathogen, the infection is not observed, but most aspects of the infection we aren't really thinking about very much. It's a complex interaction, if you think about it, between the pathogen and the host at many levels. Um, it's especially, as they said, the case with opportunistic accidents, pathogens. And the only asymptomatic infections, this is especially true of meningococci, but it's many other things now also with COVID, of course, are the major drivers of transmission often. And that's all happening below the surface. We don't know that's going on. And my argument is that if you want to eliminate disease, you really need to know about that process. And in the absence of knowing about that information, control can be difficult or even impossible. Now, control of disease isn't always achievable, and that's not always the goal of vaccines. Sometimes just stopping people dying of the disease or preventing the worst manifestations of the problem. But um, quite often we do want to eliminate diseases. So I wanted to start um, with this, which is something that came before my lifetime. Um, so the introduction of diphtheria vaccines in England and Wales. And th this encapsulates a lot of different concepts, I think. One is, of course, now it's very difficult to persuade anybody that diphtheria is an important disease. I use this slide a lot with my undergraduates to say, if you want to argue against people who don't like vaccines, this is the slide. Look at the numbers. These are people infected very ill or dying before the introduction of the vaccine. And then you see this very steep reduction, which is characteristic of sort of herd immunity effects. But the interesting thing is that this vaccine isn't working exactly the way you would have thought about it. Some of you may, is that it actually, this is a coating vaccine that is largely, though not entirely, based on the, um, on the toxoid, the, 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 the um, but, 
Diphtheria, can I, can I bacteria and diphtheria with the tox, containing the toxin is what causes the disease. But the toxin is a gene on an element that's inside a phage. So the bacterium is infecting a human, but the bacterium is itself infected with a phage, which is itself infected with the gene for the toxin that causes the problem, and the vaccines against the toxin. So what the vaccine actually does is the immunization not only stops people getting disease, but it prevents the t- transmission of the tox plus bacteria. So you're actually targeting, this is a really tough, we didn't know it at the time, it's a really targeted protein vaccine. It's stopping the transmission of the uh, of the uh, agent itself. Now, that's great, and it's sort of eradicated disease, but it doesn't eradicate Corinthian diphtheria. It might be possible to eradicate the toxin, and that would be a good thing, or the phage, that would also be a good thing. But of course, as you all know, if you don't maintain immunization constantly, it comes back. And we, we continually have outbreaks arising now and then because, because we haven't maintained immunization. But of course, the problem with maintaining immunization when the disease has largely gone away is a real problem because people will tell you, well, the diphtheria isn't a problem. I've never seen one. I've never seen a case. So, that's an example of a sort of really good sort of herd immunity, high efficacy vaccine going back a long time. Now, when I came into the field, well, actually, when I started my undergraduate studies, exactly in this year, uh, we were very optimistic. And in fact, I had been very influenced by an amazing book, and this talk is influenced by McFarlane Burnett, called The Natural History of Infectious Disease. You may know him. He's the man who proposed the clonal selection hypothesis. But... In his book, the natural, infectious, uh, the natural History of Infectious Disease, he posits the idea that disease is an ecological process. He was a medic, but he really got that. And in, that was the last edition was written in 1975. Just after that, about 1977 was the last case of, uh, um, of uh, smallpox, and we all were very optimistic. My professor at Reading, I was an undergraduate, had, had been involved in the smallpox eradication campaign in South Africa called uh, Colin Kaplan. He'd been involved in producing the vaccine. Uh, but, and we thought we wouldn't, I, I never dreamt I would be here 43 years later talking to you about vaccines and infectious disease because that was clearly not going to be the case. We just eradicated smallpox. We were going to eradicate everything else. But we got to remember, I get my undergraduates to write very, very, uh, essays about this. Varolia is a very particular type of disease. It's got a single antigenic type. It's not zoonosis. Human cases are symptomatic. So you can identify them. Natural reservoir. A natural infection or immunization gives you long-term immunity, sterilizing immunity, and, you know, there was a safe and effective vaccine. Even so, if you read Fenner's classic account, this was not easy, but it was done. But unfortunately, apart from Vindipest, which is a disease of cattle, this was the last time it was done. So the report carried on us using vaccines to eliminate disease isn't very good. So that was just when I started as an undergraduate. After I'd finished my doctor, my degree and doctorate and went over to, um, went on to, uh, uh, work at NIBSC. In 1988, the Global Vaccination Initiative was introduced against polio. And of course, that was because we thought it was going to be a radical because there were only three serotypes. We had no animal or environmental reservoir the same way. It was an effective and inexpensive vaccine that blocked transmission, OPV, um, lifelong immunity against transmission. And so that was, uh, we were going to eliminate uh, polio free well by 2005. Obviously, we didn't manage that. Why not? Well, there's all sorts of reasons. One is the political environmental. But the other problem, which was find out around that time with new sequencing technologies, Phil Miner, who was my colleague at NIBSC, um, uh, um, and uh, uh, um, um, among others, they sequenced viruses uh, from infants, and they found that actually when you give an infant a live OPV virus, uh, a, a, a live vaccine, it reverts to being fully virulent. So the child then starts excreting fully virulence. So that's a bit of an issue. Um, what's slightly worse than that, you can get asymptomatic transmission as well. So that means not like smallpox where you can identify things. And as you may know, people, pop, we've, we've had some cases of asymptomatic transmission in London with cases of virus. They find them in the sewage, but they don't know, they haven't identified the cases necessarily. And finally, immun- immunocompromised individuals can excrete fully virulent virus for a very long period of time. So, Although we made tremendous advances in reducing the amount of disease from that map in the background, which was a state situation in 1988, we've almost got there. We haven't quite got there, and actually it's really difficult to get there. So, you know, this is... Uh, so this and Herd immunity is more complicated than you can just say it. 
So I like this particular slide that was produced. Unfortunately, the legend's gone, but no mind. Uh, this slide from the NIH. Now, synthesizing a lot of the things that you've heard already, we know that infectious agents transmit about susceptible hip, hip and they may or may not cause disease. Um, the, um, this slide says uh, immunized or diseased, but actually they could just be infected. The red ones could be infected, not diseased. You wouldn't necessarily know about that then. Uh, but we also know, um, and you will have heard, you can know about the concept of R0, that, um, why is this not moving on? Um, I'm, I'm not, my, my advancer isn't working. I think it's, yeah, thank you. So under isolated conditions, we can calculate this thing called the, uh, the, the vaccination critical threshold, which is this magic number, one minus one over R naught. Now this makes lots of assumptions, but it tells you that the amount of vaccinated people you need to get to, to, to get the immunity. And then if you achieve that threshold, the, the pathogen will die out. So the required, the greater the R naught though, the more difficult it is to achieve. So this is why measles remains a problem, because although we have good vaccines and good vaccination rates, the VC, vaccine critical level, is about 95% because the R0 is about 16 to 20. So this is tough, but it's doable. So we can understand that. But of course, it also depends on these, this uh, model being as you expect it to be, which is like a, a freely mixed model, which is sort of very easy. So there's a couple of references here about this. So that's how herd immunity works, but herd immunity is a mathematical concept which probably in the real world is never quite fully realised. You know, we aren't bunches of people like this. So, for example, Shamez was talking about um, uh, um, uh, group semen in because We know we've got good herd immunity about that. I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, seal group C disease is still around, so it hasn't been completely driven out. And that's probably because our transmission systems aren't entirely mixed and aren't entirely like mathematical models. But nevertheless, we, we know a good thing about how herd immunity works. So I don't need to say too much about this because the conjugate polysaccharides are the enormously good thing that I've seen. I, I feel I've been very privileged to live through an era of conjugate vaccines. I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, and these have made a huge difference with Nicaea meningitis, Haemophilus influenzae, and Streptococcus pneumoniae we've heard about, and I'll talk about those in more detail. But they are immunological magic. You've got to remember that most vaccines often aren't as good as the real infection. Conjugate polysaccharides are better than the real infection. They give you much better vaccination. So, for example, you'll typically get many episodes of colonization of meningococci over your lifetime. But if you get a good dose of polysaccharide conjugate vaccine, then that will protect you probably for a long time, if not life, but certainly many, many years, against not only disease, but also carriage. And that's because of Andy described in this nice review with Peter Dedley, the, these magic, immunological magic of how you glue a T-cell dependent uh, to, uh, protein antigen, usually a, a toxoid, to the polysaccharide vaccine uh, antigens, which are poor immunogens, and you get this B-cell help and you get an amazingly good immune response, which is effective against carriage as well. And so that is a huge advantage of the conjugate polysaccharides. And the reason that we've had such success against these diseases has been because of that. So, uh, and I just want to talk that through, but there's also been some sting in the tail. So, uh, Sham has told this story, but I'm going to, I'm going to unpack it a little bit more detail. So this is Haemophilus influenzae type B disease. Now, fortunately, only one capsule, the Haemophilus type B capsule, regularly associated with, um, uh, causing uh, meningitis and, 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 and uh, there's interesting reasons for that. And, and one clone associated with that one capsule. So the vaccine's very effective. Now, we introduced the vaccine while I, just after I'd started at NIBSC, I'd been there a few years, and the vaccine was introduced in 1993. So it was in the, I went there in 1998. And um, the UK decided that we're going to give a two, three, four month schedule. That wasn't maybe the optimum schedule, but they wanted to fit it in with all the others. They didn't want to introduce a different schedule. And then a catch up one to four years. And I remember talking to the, about this to my boss at the head of the bacteriology division at NIBSC, where we were releasing all these vaccines. And he said, well, I said, what, 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 what's the catch up? He said, well, this is because we don't want children, to, parents of children to think they're behind because most of the disease actually is in uh, younger children. But, um, we want, you, you know, we want to make sure that, that everybody feels, uh, feels involved. So that was fine. And as you can see, a very, very effective reduction similar to what you'd expect with herd immunity now we go along and um 
as you can see, about the time my oh, have I got a pointer here? Um, as you can see, about about the time my daughter was first daughter was born, nineteen ninety nine, the disease was starting to go up again. Um, and then by the time it got to my second daughter being born in 2003, it was getting to alarming levels. Uh, now, what we subsequently and then so they introduced a catch up then for six months to four years. And then later, a 12 month booster was added. Why was this? What was going on? Well, it was because when we introduced the vaccine, we introduced the vaccine largely worrying about direct protection effects and not thinking at all about herd immunity effects. What, of course, we did is most of the carriage was in slightly older children. So by immunising everybody up to the age of one year, we created a herd immunity effect, which, of course, waned because we now know, which we didn't do then, if you immunise children at two, three and four months, with even with a conjugate, you get a good-ish protection against disease, transitory, but no protection against carriage, and it's transitory. You have to immunise older children to get the good protection against carriage. So, in fact, what we needed to do was introduce this booster to improve herd immunity, and that's... What we did to um, so boost at 12 months is required. And then, as Shamas was saying, that actually the logic of that is you only have to immunize the older people where there's a transmission event going on and then you can protect the younger people as well. So we, we were learning as we went along with these vaccines. That was a learning experience. And of course, in the midst of this, we were introducing the meningococcal C vaccine conjugates about this time. Still, also, when we introduced the C vaccines, there wasn't uh consideration about herd immunity effects it was mostly introduced on the basis of direct protection so here's another in interesting little story about herd immunity and this this again i have another little personal anecdote this is 2004 uh, just after i had um, become a university lecturer and there was an outbreak of cases in several universities uh, amongst 20 year olds and this is a really interesting graph i sometimes give it to my applicants to to, to work through because it's quite a difficult one to but this is all of the cases that occurred in 2004 by the birth year of the individuals who had the disease and so it's interesting you see that all of these people were sort of young adults and teenagers now i had a particular association with it because although i i was born way back here and almost certainly had had in fact my mother is convinced i'd had mumps but anyway i somehow managed to get what i'm convinced was mumps because any of you who knows about mumps in adults know there's a very very typical syndrome in young in men but anyway i won't go into that um uh, the uh, but I'm almost convinced I had it, but I probably caught it from these kids. Now, why did we end up with having an outbreak in 20-year-olds 20, 20 years after the vaccination? Well, the secret is here. If you look at when MMR was introduced and the second dose of MMR was introduced, you can see that um, that it was just in the age groups just that had just missed getting the vaccine. So almost certainly what happened here is that when we introduced MMR and the second dose, you had a group in which they didn't get the vaccine, but the amount of, of, of mumps transmission was reduced. So they didn't get natural immunity either. If you'd been burned earlier, everybody had the disease. And so they were all immune. If you immunized older, everybody more or less had been vaccinated. But you had this plug of susceptibles going through the population. And suddenly it appears with an outbreak of disease. Again, an unexpected consequence of herd immunity. That what happened here is as herd immunity was being broken down, we'd actually accumulated a bunch of susceptibles. And one of them probably gave me months very painfully, I might add. Anyway, so that's an interesting example of how uh, probably waning immunity went, went through in that. So. I'm also charged to think about antigenic diversity, which, of course, plays into this as well. Now, all the diseases we've been thinking about at the moment, um, polio, smallpox, um, diphtheria, are not really challenged by antigenic diversity. But, of course, antigenic diversity is a major problem. Um, we've, been, we've, been, we've heard about that from Shamis, about how, how they're doing it. And the trouble is that pathogens and commensals, they all have to deal with our immune system, and they're very good at dealing with it. And if you think about it, there's virtually no significantly variable pathogen that we have a satisfactory vaccine against. Think about AIDS. When I started off 1988, it was the AIDS directed program. I worked so big, huge amounts of research. Everybody was confidently going around in 1988 saying we're going to have an AIDS vaccine in 10 years. That was in 1988. They were saying that. It's very, very difficult. Think about malaria. Very difficult to make vaccines against significantly variable organisms. And how they can be variable is that you can have standing variation, which is 
there's just it's accumulated in the population over many millions of time. Mm-hmm. There's also you can have mutation, recombination, genetic exchange, all that's going on constantly. Um, uh, and of course, you can have repertoires. For example, in the parasites like malaria, you can have uh, phase variation, etc., uh, uh, lots of change. And of course, with influenza, you've got a huge genotic variation. So there's a large amount of ways that the, the pathogen can avoid this. Now, the interesting thing is. I've spent my life listening to people saying they're going to find a conserved antigen. That was the basis of the Bexero program. It's really hard to find variable pathogens, conserved pathogens, conserved antigens in variable pathogens that truly avoid the immune system. And that's because they spent a lot of time evolving to avoid that. So they, uh, they, you know, this is these, they managed to exist a lot of these conserved proteins below immune surveillance. So that is a real problem. The antigenic variability is still something we have got yet to uh, deal with. Um, although we've got many more ideas about that now with uh, with uh, uh, sequencing surveillance. And I put this slide in just to illustrate that uh, with the COVID pandemic, this is how we can now uh, do things with high throughput sequencing. Um, uh, you, you know, we, we can do, when I started nucleotide sequencing, I had to build the equipment. OK, and it took me a whole PhD to sequence one gene from E. coli. Right. OK, you snigger. I got a nature paper out of it, but I did sequence a whole gene. And there were probably a few hundred of us sequencing genes in the world. Now it's a mass industry. It's great. So we, we've and as you can see with uh, this is work from the uh, um, the COVID consortium in the in the UK. They, they, you can just sequence huge amounts of DNA sequence. Now you can get vast amounts of information. You can correlate, as you can see in the. Uh, picture over here, correlate variation of the spike protein this is with, with various other conditions. So you can start learning a lot. So now whole pathogen genomes are available. We can get a lot of more information to try and deal with these variation problems. The problem is, of course, what this does is it, it defines the problem, but it doesn't necessarily enable us to solve the problems of variation. Because, you know, even um, although uh, there's a lot of talk about COVID variants, COVID is not a very variant pathogen compared to the vast majority of pathogens that we have to deal with. It's young and it has varied and there is some escape from it, but it's not really variable in the sage, for example, that influenza is we were hearing about earlier, or even some of the bacterial vaccines, bacterial pathogens. So what we can do is we can't, can start thinking about models of variation. So trying to incorporate all this model data together to give us some idea. And I spent a lot of time uh, working on this along with um, my colleague Sinetra Gupta, which was work we did. This was about the time I moved to Oxford when I BSC. Uh, I must, uh, this is a slide for, this is very old data. This was da- data generated by mostly hybridization rather than actual sequencing, but you know, it's a technique. But what we found is with the meningococcus that although there's lots of variants, there isn't as much variation as you'd like because when you, or you'd think, because as you sequence more bigger populations, you find that variation is very lumpy. It's also lumpy in a very particular way. And Sunetra had come. When I showed Sunetra, met her the first time, she couldn't believe it because she had a model developed for malaria and our data fitted it. And the model in short is this, that if you've got every possible antigenic type in a, in a transmission system and you've got recombination going, if you have immune, immune selection, you can't have every variant existing because there'll be cross immunity. So it will sort into what she calls non-overlapping types. And this is precisely what you see here. You only get epitope 5 with epitope 2, or if it's 7, 2 with 4, or 18 with 13, 1. So that actually means that the complexity of the problem is less than we might have thought. We could, there is predictable behavior. It isn't just a mush of every possible variation. Our immune systems impose a structure on the pathogens. So that's something that we can take some, uh, some, um, some uh, uh, sort of comfort from. We've developed this a lot. And uh, as you can see, this is some data from, uh, from from Ellie Watkins and other and a couple of graduate students. The interesting thing is, what we not only do you find these non-overlapping variants, which I just showed you, which you could see on the what I call what Sunet uh, called the Manhattan skyline. If you look over time, these are three-year periods. You can see that it changes. So as Shamez was saying, the population uh, changes over time. It changes in ways uh, which 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 are sort of predictable because it's not infinitely variable. Okay, cool. And we've now realized that bacterial pathogen populations often have a range of different types. Um, and so 
we developed the concept of uh, meta antigenic types, which you can understand the antigens, but also metabolic types. And this is, uh, Shamos was talking about the particular virulent clones. And here's some work we did a while ago on pneumococcus. Now, this is looking at the whole genomes. And the interesting thing is that the pneumococcus is divided into these multiple different clones or metabolic types, and they're each associated with different vaccine antigens, capsules. The interesting thing is, as you introduce vaccines, you get a shift of the capsule type onto a different metabolic type. So you might, so a particularly successful metabolic type may just acquire a new capsule, and that means you're chasing the target with the vaccine. So I'm not going to go, I'm out of time, but I've nearly finished because you've heard about how uh, whole genomes were worked to develop, um, to, to develop the Bixero vaccine. Um, and that was uh, both GSK and Pfizer discovered this new immunogen, factor H binding protein, which is part of these two new vaccines. Um, it took 20 years to develop both of them. The Pfizer one, as um, Shamos was saying, uh, the Pfizer one has just got one antigen, the FH2, two variants of it, the FHBP protein. The Bexero has these four. Now, all of these are variable antigens, but you can extract them from the database. So we've been doing genomic surveillance of meningococci for the last 13 or 14 years uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the H uh, Health Protection Agency, now uh, Health Security Agency. And so what we can do is we can see what the variants are. And what um, a colleague of mine, Charlene Rodriguez, was able to do was to collate within our PubMLST database that we run the extracted sequence information from the isolates that have been sequenced with laboratory data to predict whether a given strain is likely to be protected. Here it is, an exact match with Tubemba and a cross factor uh, uh, against Bexero. So this enables us to get some sort of prediction of what, whether uh, a particular strain will be covered by the vaccine, because you cannot possibly test every single strain. Um, and this is just some data from Scotland, just to close with. In Scotland, uh, since the introduction of the vaccine up until a couple of years ago, there were 82 cases of disease. And what we found is that all of the disease either occurred in infants that were before eligible for their first dose, or some who had had a dose but uh, still got the vaccine preventable disease. But if you look at, there were no vaccine, the disease predicted to be not vaccine preventable in infants with two doses. And the only disease we got in older children was uh, with kids who had not been immunized. And this is now all being published. Too. So this really showed that the Bexera vaccine worked really, really well. And we were able to show that. And the summary of the data is here. So if you've got people fully vaccinated to schedule, we the only people who had disease were ones that had non-reactive types, didn't have good enough data, or were types that we couldn't predict, because you can't predict every type. Whereas you see the only green ones are in the partially or the fully, and those are ones we would have thought to be vaccinated. So to conclude this Cook store, we now know, as Jamas has just said, that the Bexero vaccine doesn't protect against carriage. So let's just summarize this whole topic I've just given you in a few slides based on the meningococcus. So we call meningococcus an accidental pathogen because um, Disease is not part of the transmission cycle. You see the transmission cycle is, is here in the pink and the red is disease. It's not part of the transmission. It's not actually an advantage for the meningococcus because it causes disease. The plain polysaccharides don't give you good protection in infants. They certainly don't protect uh, uh, only short term, only short term protection in adults. Um, and that's why they didn't stop and they don't stop transmission. So that's why the non-conjugate vaccines were only partially useful short-term protection, mostly in older people. The conjugates, on the other hand, brilliant. They don't work so well in infants. They do partial protection, but they're really good at stopping um, older, adolescent, uh, older people getting disease, and they totally block transmission, potentially eliminating the disease. But the B vaccines, the physical vaccines, very good at protecting individuals, both young and old, against disease, but they don't protect against carriage. So... You might, if people are talking about different meningococcal vaccines, people who often think they can use a B vaccine like they can use a C vaccine, but you can't. So the conclusions is, are, oh, 
Infections are dynamic, multi-component ecological process, and occasionally disease results from infection. Try and think of infection and disease as being two separate things. You can be infected and not diseased, but you can't usually be diseased and not infected. Different pathogen host environment combinations are different. Don't expect all pathogens to be the same. If you can interrupt pathogen transmission, as Sham has shown very nicely, that's the most effective way because you protect everybody, including the unimmunized uh, cohorts. But the vaccine has to prevent transmission, including chronic infection. The transmission system has to be targeted and the appropriate level of protection must be maintained. So finally, um, all vaccines, but actually that, oh, I thought I'd change that. Sorry. I'd, uh, not all vaccines, many vaccines are challenged by the evolution of vaccine escape variants. And combining high throughput sequencing approaches with phenotopic can enable you to monitor that, develop predictive models, and identify novel vaccine components. For example, the surveillance, uh, genomic surveillance of meningococci from 2010 to, 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 to date was what enabled us to identify the South American clone, which led to the vaccine intervention that Shamed explained. And sorry, I've overrun a little bit, but that's it. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. So are there, are there questions? Because we got started a little bit late, we're going to go till noon for questions. But we'll take Maru in the back. Uh, thank you for a great talk. My question relates to your first slide that you talked mm -hmm. about. And I guess knowing what we know about poliovirus now and thinking measles virus meets all the criteria, biological criteria for elimination, poliovirus doesn't. Is it about the coverage? What are your thoughts about, I guess, the impact on elimination for both polio and measles from the, I guess, well, I, it, biological It's quite scenario. interesting. I mean, the problem, I think, with both elim elimination and eradication, it's quite interesting. Some people, <laughs> cause people will say smallpox isn't actually eradicated because it still exists, you know. Right? But, yeah, um, there are people probably in the audience much better qualified to me to speak on this. Elimination eradication campaigns are enormously expensive and difficult. Um, reading Fenner's account of smallpox, which was sort of easier, the world was an easier place then. It was an easier problem. I remember, you know, Colin Kaplan, my old professor, his son was involved in this and they did ring vaccination. You could tell who had got vaccinated. I mean, it was only monkeypox, mpox that created some problem. It's not easy to mobilize these campaigns. And yes, you know, it, it I think there's a lot of diseases, and there may be people in the audience much better place to answer this than me. There are many diseases we could probably eliminate or reduce to a low level if only we could get the, the immunization rates up high enough. The problem is, of course, that the COVID epidemic has led to a lot of reductions in immunizations of vaccines that we do have. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of diseases stalking the earth now, which if you look at really rationally, you would think, my 40 year old ago self would have thought we wouldn't really have you know and i think there's a there's a bit of a, an indictment of us as, as a sort of global community that we haven't managed it but it's a testament to how difficult it is and of course one of the other reasons why smallpox was so uh, easy to target in a sense was that it was it was such a completely ghastly horrible disease that affected so many people in such i mean the king of england agreed to have his kids variolated with, with, with Lady Wortley Montague's method, you know, in the 18th century, because he was so scared, even though that was a dangerous procedure. So it's, it's getting that support, the financial support, the community involvement and so on, and reaching, as I said earlier, reaching everyone. One of the biggest problems the polio, uh, campaign has had uh, has been, you know, managing to get everybody to accept the vaccine. And, oh, I meant to say, actually, that, that photograph I put up of Ali Mal Mian, Malin, you may know of him. If not, look up on the polio eradication side. He was the last known smallpox case. He was a hospital worker who had not had his shots and he was the last case. But he's one of my heroes because he became a real vaccination enthusiast. And he sadly died of malaria in, I think, about 2013. And there's a little tribute to him on the thing, actually working on the polio vaccination campaign. So it's that level of commitment that is needed to eradicate disease. And I think we sometimes underestimate the field officers, the people out in the field delivering these vaccines. You know, it's it's really hard. So I don't know if that's a good answer to, <laughs> to the question, but it, it's just a testament to how difficult it is, I think. Right here on the end. Yes. Thank you, uh, Amela from Cameroon. I'm going to go 
um, also on the polio vaccine mm. because in Africa we still use the oral polio vaccine mm. and uh, it's as, it's associated with a lot of circulating vaccine to arrive polio virus yes. Yes. Uh, versus the IPV vaccine. So from an immunological standpoint, what do you think about combining these two vaccines or the use of either or? So it it's a real conundrum. So I love telling the polio story to my undergraduate because the the, the, the polio story is just amazing. It has everything. So when the two polio vaccines were developed, the original ones, Salk and Sabin sort of were big rivals and they sort of despised each other, despite being very similar in lots of ways. I suppose that's true, isn't it? We always dislike the people who are most like ourselves. And, and, and actually, it's a sort of good lesson in science because they, they were both convinced they were right. And actually, they were both right. Because on the one hand, Salk said the only good polio virus is a dead polio virus. And so it had to be the inactivated one. And, and of course, on the other hand, Sabin said, aha, if you use, if you use the natural route, you'll get transmission blocking and, and, and then it'll be easy to, to, um, it will be the administer. And as I say, they were both right in a sense. We couldn't have had the polio eradication campaign without OPV because it's easy. You can train somebody to immunize someone in like minutes and, and it's easy and, and so on. It's cheap and it transmission blocks, which IPV doesn't. But then on the other hand, what they didn't know is it would have this problem with the vaccine derived. And they, uh, my old colleague and chum, Andy McAdam, and, and colleagues have developed this new OPV, NOPV, which is supposed to revert, but it still does revert now. They started using it a little bit less well. So it's a conundrum, but it just shows how the, the science is not easy. It, these things are always a bit more complicated than you think. So there's been endless articles written on the polio endgame. See, in an ideal world, what you do is what we've done in the, in the UK and many other countries, go over to IPV and then, but you, you have to probably keep that going for like 20 or 30 years at least, because there's this famous case of an individual, um, uh, immunocomodized individual in the UK who they've been following shed, shedding virulent polio vaccine in, a, in Birmingham for 28 years. That, you know, because this is somebody who's, who's who's immunocompromised they, they've got a, a, a chronic infection of polio it's not doing them any harm but it's not you know they, they can't cure it you know they, they, they don't so how do you maintain you know as i said even with diphtheria it's difficult to maintain um immunization because people will say well the disease has gone away so it's i'm afraid i wish i had an easy answer but I don't know if, if anybody in the audience has a better answer. I'd be, any of my esteemed colleagues at the back. I, it's a real conundrum. It's, it's hard. Um, uh, because, you know, do you really want to keep immunizing? And I'm not quite sure exactly where the thinking is now at, at the WHO, but there's, you know, we, we're so close at getting rid of polio. And of course it has been reduced to a really low level, but then it, it pops up in New York. Yeah. <laughs> and London. Yeah. Jose, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure if I understood it right. I, I, I saw that, um, um, you know, you mentioned selection pressure, which could be generated by vaccines, mm -hmm. which could re re result to escape variants and class yeah. I species. Um, would this result to a significant decrease in vaccine efficacy later on, which would result to retweaking of vaccine components to more contemporary strains? Well, yeah, I mean, the obvious example of this, I think, where, which you've heard about is, is, is pneumococci, where, where, where you can get these vac you can get vaccine escape variants or, or, or variants sort of arising. So yeah, if you've got a vaccine that or if you've got a pathogen that can alter, it will. Now, the interesting thing is, it hasn't happened with polio. It didn't happen with, it's not inevitable, uh, you know. Um, so polio, the, the original vaccine strains still work. Uh, smallpox, it still worked. MMR, they all still work. So, but with organi organisms with significant variation. So I was very worried. The reason we did those big carriage studies that... Um, uh, that uh, Shamez mentioned on meningococca, I was really worried that there would be an exchange, capsule exchange for the meningococcus. And it didn't happen in 1999, but then it did sort of happen in 2015. So, so when, after, after we'd done our big studies, everybody said, well, you know, you were wrong. It didn't happen. No, it wasn't that you were wrong. It just, it happened a bit later. So we have to keep on top of the game. You can't, unless you can get to the stage like you did with smallpox, 
and you, and you say, right, you know, we, we've, we've completely eliminated it from transmission. You, you can't ever get away from surveillance. And that's one of the problems. Um, you know, as I say, even with, we had these other questions, lots of the diseases, you know, if we could eliminate them or eradicate them, but if, if, if not, you know, there is always the problem with these various, and, and I, I, don't, I think I'm fair, it's right to say, I can't think of any, what I would call really significantly variable pathogen that we have an ideal vaccine against. So, and we just have to keep our guard up against them. I'm um, just kind of piggybacking on, on top of that question. So if you think that we have to continually change um, some of the variants for the vaccines, maybe because of immune escape, et cetera, um, do you expect that the vaccine efficacy can also be reduced with these subsequent variants because of potential uh, what we also heard before is, you know, original antigenic sin, I mean, you know, imprinting, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this one, but I have to be a bit careful here. But Martin, I think, I think I'm right in saying that the Omicron variant was the first one that sort of escaped adaptive immunity because I think the previous variants were escaping um, innate immunity. So, so yeah, we can get organisms evolving away. Or with the, in the case of the meningococcus, for example, there is huge antigenic variation already there so it's not like it needs to evolve <laughs> you know because and antigenic variation has usually evolved as a consequence of natural natural immunity which is acquired so for example we get meningococci we get immunity to it we clear them so we get another variant so that's what straight synetra strain theory comes from so there will be these sort of turnovers from one to the other and of course malaria sort of actively exploits that it sits you know falciparum malaria sits in your sits in your um sits in your liver produces a particular strain, grows like crazy, creates this transitory uh, uh, parasitemia, which is, you know, hugely dangerous to the host, but transitory. You get immunity, you damp it all down, and then the pathogen just crops up again. That's why it's sort of relapsing fever, you know, a little while later with a completely different set of variants. And your, your original, you know, of course, and with adults, this isn't such a problem because they usually recover, but, of course, the problem is with young children, they often... Die. So, so it, it, the, if there could one message apart from that, that you have to think about evolutionary population biology. One message I'd like to really pay I mean, all diseases are particular, as I say. They, that you have to think about the biology of the individual disease. So, some of them, and this is the problem we had with, I think, with SARS-CoV. Uh, too. A lot of people thought it was going to be like influenza or they thought it was going to be like, you know, and it isn't. You've got to think, particularly with a new disease, you've got to sort of think it a little bit more widely and think about what the biology is. And of course, that's hard when you don't have the data.